Cuban leaders to make Good Friday an official holiday in the communist country. Uh, a long-awaited, long-suspected meeting between Fidel Castro and Pope Benedict will take place, the result of some back-channel negotiations between the Cuban government and the Vatican here. Fidel Castro saying that he's requested a simple and modest meeting, uh, probably a much shorter meeting than his brother Raul Castro uh, enjoyed yesterday with the Pope. That meeting went on for more than 40 minutes, and we understand that some of the highlights of the meeting uh, included the Pope asking Raul Castro for an expanded role for the Catholic Church in Cuba, saying, quote, give us a chance to do more for the Cuban people. The Pope also made a very specific request, asking that Good Friday be added as an official holiday here in Cuba. That request is under consideration now by the Cuban authorities. Uh, it also follows a request that John Paul II successfully made, asking that Christmas be included again as an official holiday uh, here in Cuba. It, 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 there were no Christian holidays uh, until uh, John Paul uh, began negotiations with the Cuban government. Uh, essentially, this trip, it seems, more and more is becoming uh, a matter of uh, finishing the work of John Paul II, Pope Benedict, walking in the steps of John Paul II and finishing uh, his trip here 14 years prior, and he'll certainly get the opportunity to do that today uh, as he dresses uh, hundreds of thousands of people from Havana's Revolution Plaza. Uh, this is the same place where John Paul II also made uh, a, a famous mass 14 years prior. But very interestingly, today Pope Benedict will be addressing from an altar in a slightly different position at the exact center of Havana's Revolution Plaza, a place where there's never been uh, a Christian or religious altar before. And that's the spot, Modita, where over the years Fidel Castro has given some of his most fiery and, and anti-U.S., anti-imperialist speeches. So we'll see if any of that fire and tough talk ends up in Pope Benedict's speech today. The violence in Syria is stopping the agenda of the Arab League summit taking place in Baghdad. Though Syrian officials were not invited to the high-level meeting, it is the first summit to be held in Iraq in more than 20 years. But while politicians rather discuss what to do about the conflicts raging next door, some Iraqis have already taken matters into their own hands. CNN's Arwa Daman has details in this report. Foreign ministers or representatives of various countries are currently meeting, as you were mentioning there, to discuss the issue of Syria. That is most certainly number one on their agenda. Now, it was Libya's foreign minister who started off, because it was Libya that ironically did hold the last uh, Arab summit. He opened his statements by saying that uh, the Arab Spring, making references to the Arab Spring, but then going on to say that the region was still facing a tragedy, and that is the tragedy of their brothers in Syria. He spoke about the murder and annihilation of the Syrian people. He was then followed by Iraq's foreign minister, who spoke about the need for a peaceful transition and also said that they would be rejecting any form of military intervention. Syria, as we all know, has been fairly divisive when it comes to Arab leaders. They have not quite yet been able to come up with a solid unified front, some believing that the Syrian opposition should be armed, other like Iraq's foreign minister calling for some sort of a transition. Iraq's foreign minister, Hoshar Zabari, has also said that this is a golden opportunity, but also a last chance for Arab leaders to find some sort of solution for Syria. And Syria is not just divisive when it comes to the Arab leadership. It has proven to be fairly divisive when it comes to Iraq as well, even amongst the Sunni tribe. Iraq's badlands, rugged, harsh, dotted with smuggling routes to and from Syria. Sunni tribes straddle the border, their loyalties cemented by decades of intermarriage. Among the most powerful, Sheikh Abu Ahmad's tribe, the Dulaim. And he's angered by what's happening in Syria. You've all seen what the Syrian government is doing. It's time to return our debt. It's our duty, he states. He doesn't want his identity disclosed, but he's sending money and weapons to rebels across the border. He claims that he sent over $300,000, 35 heavy machine guns, hundreds of AK-47s, and around 30 fighters into the Syrian province of Deir Zur, including expert bomb makers and ambush specialists. 
The sheikh says Syrian members of the Dulaim tribe came to help them when U.S. forces began their offensive against the Sunni stronghold of Fallujah back in 2004. Some of them died, some of them carried out suicide attacks against U.S. forces, he says. Now it's his men's turn to help. Some are hardened fighters, but there are also people who don't have experience, youth who didn't fight in Fallujah, who are sitting around unemployed, so we train and send them over. The Sheikh's claims are impossible to verify. There are no accurate estimates about how many guns or fighters are being smuggled across the 600-kilometer border into Syria. And not all the Sheikhs here believe in arming the Syrian rebels. Sheikh Ali al-Shallal of the prominent al-Mahamda tribe is keeping a close eye on events in Syria. We support the Syrian revolution, he says, but he doesn't believe in arming the opposition. Instead, he and other leaders organized demonstrations like this one last month in Fallujah, with people declaring their support for various cities under siege, offering sanctuary in Iraq, and rallying to collect food and other humanitarian aid. Years on, scars remain from the insurgents' pitched battles with the Americans. The people of Fallujah know only too well what war brings. And they know the uprising in Syria, with similar sectarian and tribal fault lines, could drag Iraq back into a state of war. And those are also concerns shared by Syria's other neighbor, Lebanon, and also by the region as a whole, underscoring why it is just so critical to bring about some sort of resolution. We now take a second break. Stay tuned. Do you know with only $100 C scratch card on Opal, you can win your dream home? Kergi! Yaiborom! What? You mean this magnificent house? Yes! It's possible. Just load $100 C scratch card on Opal to win your dream home. Fully equipped furniture. Not only that, but every two weeks you can win beautiful surface. Bedroom sets make your dream come true. Load hundred dollars is card card on Opal. Cause the more you load, the better your chances are. Kirgi, Yaiboro. It's only possible with your national GSM provider. Gamsel, Yaiboro. And before we go, a reminder of our headlines. The chairman of the Independent Electoral Commission has made the usual call ahead of elections. The need for the masses to abide by rules and regulations governing the electioneering process. Activists looking forward to Pope Benedict XVI making the case for political reforms in communist Cuba have had their hopes dashed. And representatives from Arab League countries have congregated in the Iraqi city, Baghdad, to discuss the long-drawn-out Syrian crisis. You can also follow that story and other JATES programs live on our website at www.jates.gm. There you can also monitor JATES Radio Live. That brings us to the end of the news. Thanks for joining us and join us again at 10 p.m. <laughs>